Okay, we're at uh, six o'clock. I think we're gonna about ready to get started. So I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind of evening webinar series presented by Sacramento Orthopedic Center and Results Physical Therapy. Uh, tonight for our inaugural uh, lecture, we're gonna talk about ultrasound guided injections. What's really great about this is this started off as a concept uh, that we kind of talked about, the four of us, that we wanted to kind of help people out in our region, kind of outreach, create a better sense of community. And we started thinking about just doing this local webinar for a bunch of people in our area. And it's kind of funny how it kind of grew and it kind of really took on a life in its own. And we'd actually had 120 people sign up from seven different countries. And it's amazing. And uh, we really thank everyone for taking their time tonight to be here, to listen to us. And uh, we're expecting to do this uh, once a month. Uh, we're gonna try to come up with some good ideas and some different topics and different thoughts, maybe have some uh, special guests come on, things like that. We're gonna have a lot of fun, I think. So if anyone has any thoughts or suggestions for the future, please don't hesitate to let us know. But tonight we're gonna start off with ultrasound guided injections. Um, I'm gonna start a poll off, just kind of get an idea about where people are with ultrasound, their experience, who are watching us. Uh, so I'm gonna send this poll out, please respond. We'll get some information real time and report how we are. So I've gone ahead and launched the polls. And so it'll be fun to see what everyone's doing. To start off, just to introduce myself, my name is Alan Hirahara. I'm the medical director, head physician at Sac State and at the Sacramento River Cats. And I do a lot of publication, teaching nationally and internationally on shoulder knee arthroscopy, ultrasound and orthobiologics. And this has been a big interest of mine for quite a while. So this is something that I'm really interested in doing. Um, Kyle Yamashiro is our physical therapist who I've been working with for close to 20 years. And he has a private practice here in Sacramento at Results Physical Therapy. He's affiliated with many Northern California colleges and professional teams, including working with me with Sac State and the River Cats. He's an expert on rehabilitation. He's actually written all of our orthobiologic protocols and has presented on this subject for over 10 years. Uh, Alberto, I forgot to put on your, uh, your, 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 your stuff. I can tell you that Alberto is an expert in orthobiologics and ultrasound as well. He's a PMNR specialist. He's a clinical faculty at, at UC Davis, as well as doing a private practice now for, uh, for, for many years. Works with me with the River Cats and as well with uh, Sac State and is very, very busy, both nationally and internationally, doing a lot more traveling recently and uh, publications as well. And uh, Mike Leathers is also gonna be our moderator tonight. He's fellowship trained in sports medicine, shoulder surgery, specialist in arthroscopy of shoulder, hip and knee. His expertise is in joint replacement of the shoulder. And he's a team physician for Christian Brothers High School football. And so Mike's gonna be taking us through this. So I'm gonna turn this over to Mike. So Mike, it's all yours, my friend. All right, thanks, Alan. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly kind of go over tonight's objectives. Uh, Mike, gonna... I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, Mike, I can hear you. Okay. Um, great, so uh, let's go over tonight's objectives. Uh, we're gonna first talk about how ultrasound can improve uh, accuracy as well as patient outcomes. We're also gonna talk about different types of ultrasound units, especially focus on high quality, but also inexpensive point of care units. We're going to discuss when to use cortisone and when to use orthobiologics, as well as show how a team approach to medical treatment and uh, therapy can help patient care. We're going to talk about different types of ultrasound units. We'll also uh, talk about billing for ultrasound use and how we can improve our reimbursement. We're going to discuss when to use cortisone. Next slide, Alan. Uh, everyone's going to be getting an uh, after survey. Uh, please fill this out. Again, this is the first time we're doing this, so we're really looking for feedback. And uh, the more feedback, the better. We really want to make this better, um, and we want to keep doing it. So please fill that out if you can. Next slide, Alan. So this is great. This is a, we're gonna host a little after party and this is perfect for um, informal back and forth questions. Um, if you have more complex questions or just wanna pick our brains about how we do, 
how we use ultrasound and the different techniques, um, please join us here. There'll be more information. I'll put this up again at the end of the <clears throat> at the end of the webinar so people can join. Next slide. And before we get started, I did just want to mention we are having another an evening webinar on January 14th where we're going to talk about large rotator cuff tears and how we treat them uh, with surgery, including both uh, shoulder replacement as well as an arthroscopic technique of a superior capsular reconstruction. And so please mark that down on your calendars, January 14th, same time, six o'clock um, for an hour. All right, I think we're ready. Alan, go ahead, you're first up. Thanks, Mike. So I'm gonna talk about that a lot of people think that they're very good at injections, but I think ultrasound can really just make you great. And that's to me, the big difference. The polling came in and it's really interesting. Actually, we have a, a wide smattering, but uh, it does look like the majority of people are new, newer to ultrasound. So that is really, this is what's, this is what's for you. And I, and I hope this can help you out. So uh, my disclosures. So Alberta and I, a couple of years ago, published a article on the intervention and procedural uses of ultrasound. And I think this will be a good reference for people if you have interest to learn more about it and get into some of the um, literature about this as well. And, and a lot of the information I'll present here is there as well. But the big fiction I think that we see is that other physicians miss, but I don't. And, and I admit, I, I thought this initially too. I thought this was something that... Uh, was going to be something that I needed to um, think about doing, and I, and I wasn't sure. But the reality is, as I learned, is that anatomical and landmark-based injections often miss their intended target. And it, once I started looking at the literature, even as early as the early 2000s, societies and agencies were recommending ultrasound as the standard of care in the placement of central lines. And very recently, as you all I'm sure know, anesthesia has adopted ultrasound as their standard of care for doing nerve blocks for epidurals or vascular access or line placement. Even uh, arterial lines are now being done strictly under ultrasound guidance. It's just a safer way to go. The problem was is that there are procedural complications, things that can happen without even trying. And unfortunately, like with the uh, line placements uh, and, and blocks, pneumothorax unfortunately was up to about 5%, which is quite a bit and can be devastating to some people. And of course, as we all know recently in the literature and in, 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 the, in the news media, you know, you don't wanna be the doctor that does that to one of the pros and then all of a sudden now you're splashed over the media. If you look in the literature, it's clear that the accuracy of knee injections, for example, which is probably one of the most common injections done, uh, has a miss rate of 20 to 30% overall. And of course, people argue, no, 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 I, I don't miss that much. There's no way. It's really easy. It's not hard to do. And the thing is, is that we're all taught to do these kind of anterometer or anterolateral uh, approaches into the knee. And yeah, it seems like it's pretty easy to get in, right? It's not hard. You can just aim to the middle of the joint. But when you think about it, and if you look at an MRI, you're going to realize that this is a spot you're trying to hit. That white area there, that's the joint. And that is a small area actually. Now, granted, this person has not much of an effusion, so let's let's give someone with an effusion. So here's someone with an effusion, and you can see that the area is a little bit larger, but still, it's not a large area, and it's a lot further than you think it is. That, for example, is four centimeters away, and most of us use an inch and a half uh, long needle, but that's only three point eight centimeters. That won't even get there. And then the problem is, is that I hear this from a lot of patients. Well, the knee, the, these knee joint injections, they hurt the cortisone shots, they're painful. And sure, there's a lot of nerves around the knee, but think about this. You're going into a joint space. There should be no pain. There should be literally nothing that's gonna hurt them because you're injecting into a space that's empty. So let's think about this. What can you hit just getting there? Well, we know that there's skin and fat, pad, skin and the subcutaneous fat. We know there's Hoffa's fat pad. And of course, if you miss, you might hit the cruciates, you might hit the condyle, you might hit the articular cartilage or the meniscus. So there's a lot there that you could actually not hit. And then this person's gonna have a lot of pain. 
And that's not going to be good. So my proposal is instead of trying to hit this one spot blindly, which unfortunately may be very difficult to do, you actually just head for the super patellar pouch and just do this lateral approach in plane. And even if you have the example of no effusion, you can still hit it because you can see it. And if we look at it, and let's put this person into a bit of flexion, we'll put our uh, probe just above the kneecap. We'll go in plane. So we're gonna bring our needle in underneath the probe in the long axis. We're gonna see this kind of an image. And when we look at this image, you might think, okay, well, what the heck am I looking at? Well, there's the quad tendon. That black there is the joint space, the effusion. Below that's the fat pad, and below that is the trabecular bone, the trochlear bone, and the cortical bone right there. Well, so you want to hit that one small area of joint space. That's what you're trying to hit. Well, the thing is, you can cheat here. You know that the distance from there to there is 3.5 centimeters. So then we know that's about one centimeter down. And then we can estimate where we're going to enter and where we're going to go. So all you have to do is kind of enter in the right spot, come in flat. We're going to see our needle. We'll be able to stop to the right spot. We know how far to get in there then it's going to be a really easy injection. That white afterwards was just air. But what's hard is if you have like a really small effusion and it's really tough to see and tough to be able to get in. And so for example, here's the same thing. This person has a small effusion. You can see the articular cartilage layer there. And so you want to be above that and not hit that cartilage. But getting in, you can actually see it, get into it and inject. And as you can see, I'm going to now inject and you can see the flow of the fluid tracking immediately. It didn't create a big bubble. Had it created a big bubble, you know I'm actually in soft tissue, fat, tendon, muscle, something, but I wasn't in a joint. So since it flowed and didn't create a bubble, I was in the joint. This is the hard one. This is the one where there's no effusion and it's like, well, where's the joint? It can be very tough to see. But as you can see, I'm bringing my needle in. I came up above the condyle, avoiding uh, the cartilage. And then you see I can, angle down to avoid the tendon. And I'm gonna get down just above the fat pad. And as I inject, you'll see that that fat pad starts to move away, but it's not creating a bubble. So I was in the joint actually. So this is a way that you can know for sure. And this way, these people have no pain. And that was the amazing thing is that when I first started doing this and I started doing ultrasound 10 years ago, it blew me away that my patients now no longer had any pain. They all walked out all happy. And it was an amazing thing because I never realized just how much I was actually missing. Shoulders are no different. Shoulders, there's a miss rate of at least 30% in subacromial bursa. And that's by experts. And that's by numerous studies, not just one study, a whole bunch of them. And that there's clear evidence that ultrasound guidance significantly improves outcome, scores, and also just satisfaction overall. That subacromial space is pretty small just like I was showing you on the knee joint. And so you, being able to see it and get to the right spot is critical. Everyone thinks of that subacromial space as a big open balloon bursa. It's not, it's a potential space. And so being able to find it, get to it and hit it exactly, reliably is important. So here what we do is we start them off, take the hand on the hip, keep that elbow back and tucked in, and we're gonna take a plane that is from the contralateral shoulder to the ipsilateral hip. We're gonna put our probe in that plane, and then we're gonna be able to do an in-plane injection underneath our probe and be able to come in. So this is what you're gonna see. What you're looking at is subcutaneous fat on top. Then there's the deltoid muscle. Then you're gonna see subdeltoid fat. That's that hyper echoic, very white double line right there. And below that, the subacromial space. Then below that, the supraspinous tendon, then eventually the tuberosity bone. So we want to hit that blue subacromial space there that's below the two hyperechoic lines. That's the subdeltoid fat. So to do that, we can just kind of come in again, same that you saw, be able to see our needle, get under that area. Now, now initially, see how I bubbled there? So that wasn't good, right? I had a little bit of a caudal tissue. But then I got into the space. And you saw it then track medially along the space. But initially, I wasn't quite in the right spot. I had to kind of pull back just a little bit to get out of that tissue. But at least I knew, I saw. Here's an example of bursitis. Being able to get into the bursitis again, pretty easy. Just hit it. And then you can see that fluid tracking medially. Here, I'm going to show you that it's not always perfect. It can be hard. 
And so you can see I'm, I'm creating the bubble, but as I back up, I back up, back up, boom, there, I hit the space correctly. So you can tell when you're in the right spot, you can see it visually to make all the difference. And you can see it's such a subtle, small amount. The fiction is using ultrasound just takes too long. It's too difficult, too long. I don't want to do it. It's, it's not going to make me efficient. Well, that's not true. Turns out incorporation into office injections adds, adds negligible time and can be more efficient. Here's an example of me doing an ultrasound. In fact, I'm taking a video of me ultrasounding while he's videoing me. And this is not taking very long. I'm just going to simply clean up my area. I'm going to numb up the area. I'm going to go ahead and take a document, the image that I'm doing ultrasound, so I can document it for the chart. And then I basically go. You can see the needle enter. And yes, that's my iPad with one of my Clarius units. And that's it, it's done, it's simple. It's just setting it up and getting it ready. And that's what my staff does for me to make this really easy. And it's very quick because there's no fuss. I knew exactly where I was going to go because I could plan it out. The next fiction, it costs too much. Well, the fact is billing can be done very effectively and implementation actually improves reimbursement. You end up getting more money out of this. So what's in my bag? I use two main systems in my office. I use a Sonosite PX, which is for high definition, very, very fine detail. I use my Clarius which is a wireless system. It's just that. And I can use my iPhone or iPad to go with it. And these are the two that I use as my go-to. The Clarius's are nice because they don't break the bank. And this is actually directly from their website. And you can see that that Clarius is only $4,900. And what's nice about that is it works very effectively. The quality is outstanding. It's wireless, can go anywhere, so it fits in the pocket. Use your iPhone or iPad. So for me, it's really an ideal situation to be able to move quickly and be able to have something on the fly. Especially when I'm covering games with Sac State or Rivercats, I actually then have it in my pocket. I can just use it and pull it out anytime I want to. And it really is just that. It's just the scanner with your display. What's also nice is almost all the systems in today's modern world have become such good quality, but they also have needle enhancement to help you be able to see better as well. And the Claris, of course, went to the dark side. Now the Sonosite PX is really nice because the quality has just been amazing. This is a newly released system that just came out literally within the last few months. And uh, I'm lucky enough to be able to have one of these. And you can just see that this person has a full thickness rotator cuff tear. There might be some small amounts of fibers there at the bottom at the distal end, but not much. And this person did not have the time to go to surgery. So they wanted an injection. We did a PRP injection for them to help moderate some of the pain. They understood the PRP was not going to heal the tear, get rid of the problem. We were going to have to go to surgery eventually, but Lisa got her some pain relief temporarily. And so here we are with the needle going into that tear. And you can see that I'm able to inject to that region directly and see it very nicely. And the quality on this image is amazing. And Alberta will go through this later, but the key point is this will increase your reimbursement. And if you're talking about entry level, just trying to get in to do it, you're gonna be able to use whatever system you want. You don't have to spend a lot of money for this. And that's kind of the key point is that you will get the reimbursement, you'll get the money back, no doubt about it in a very short amount of time. So it doesn't require a large investment initially at all. Alberto and I wrote this paper in 2016 on uh, coding and reimbursement. Virtually all of it is the same. There's very little difference from then to now. So feel free to go look that up and uh, take a look at it uh, after this. If in case you have specific questions about billing, it's all in there. The next fiction, what I do works and I just don't need it. Well, the thing is, is that orthobiologics for me has completely changed the way I treat patients now. And I have to have new paradigms because for the most part, we have a lot of patients coming in asking for things like PRP, stem cells, amnion, whatever. And cortisone is not the only option anymore. And so you have to be thinking about where you put it and how you use it. And it's critical to be point specific. So it's no longer okay to be shotgun and just shoot some drug into the area and it's gonna help. You really have to be point specific. So for example, patellar tendinopathy my use of ultrasound has really expanded my knowledge and understanding of patellar tendinopathy alone. 
For example, it spans from normal to fusiform swelling to partial tearing to full ruptures. And each of these can be treated differently and don't necessarily, except for the rupture, necessarily require surgery. And this can be done all conservatively in the office with ultrasound. And the reason why I started getting into uh, PRP and started getting into orthobiologics starting in 2007 is that cortisone has risks. It softens and damages cartilage. It weakens and ruptures tendons. It gives you potential AVN of the bone, increases your risk of infection, as many other problems, including problems with diminishing the activity of the immune system. And more importantly for me surgically is this crystal deposition, which can harm the tissue and make things more brittle, more prone to tearing. These are not okay. And as a surgeon, what's even worse for me is the more recent literature that describes the negative effect of preoperative cortisone injections on cuff repair and outcome an increased risk of revision. And it's been very clear that more people that are getting more cortisone shots are failing. And so we have to be very careful that if we think we're gonna be taking these people to surgery, we should not be doing cortisone before their surgery. Even single injections can elicit small risks of revision. And if you do it close to the index time of surgery, usually within one to three months, significantly increases your risk. And if you do two or more, it puts them at great risk that that surgery is going to fail. So that's what got me into PRP. And then you have to understand that this is not a new phenomenon. It was first described in the literature in 1969 and that over the eighties, it was used quite a bit in even meniscal repair. And even in 1999, the FDA actually approved PRP for use in the US. So this is not a new technology. This has been around a long time. The basic science is already done. We already know very clearly now that it does work because that's the beginning of how our body heals our problems. PRP augments proliferation of tenocytes, osteoblasts, myocytes. It diminishes inflammation. That's with leukocyte poor PRP as opposed to leukocyte rich. Diminishes pain, augments HA secretion and augments stem cell migration proliferation. We now have level one evidence. PRP is superior to HA. PRP is superior to placebo. We know that it works in patellar tendinopathy. We know that it helps with partial rotator cuff tears. So knowing all this, which is something that I started in 2007, that's what made me get into ultrasound in 2009. I was at a course in uh, Germany talking about PRP, and I suddenly realized that all the Europeans and Asians around me had been using ultrasound for years. And what they were able to do with it blew me away. And I realized I had to get into it. And that brings me to this case to show you. This was a case of an Achilles in 2018. Actually, this was my Achilles that hurt a lot in 2018. And we found that my tendon had swollen to six millimeters and had this defect. And just as a comparison, that's normal. And you can see that mine is clearly not normal. So I let Alberto stick a needle in my Achilles and it hurt a lot. Didn't feel good at all, but the PRP actually helped quite a bit and did a big difference. So this was it in July 18th, and this was in September 7th, just simply six weeks later. And it made a massive difference, not just in how I felt, but it also made a difference in how it looked. And eventually I have not had any problems since it was able to fully heal. And you can tell based off that scan in July, that was heading for potential rupture had I gone off to go play some little basketball. So I had to be careful. And that's what I'm talking about that this new paradigm of orthobiologics has changed what I can do in the office and does not necessarily need surgery for some of my patients. And being able to offer that to my patients, I think is a huge boon. That is not something that just I can do. Anyone can do this. Anyone can offer people orthobiologics and ultrasound injections. We know that stem cells are the billion blocks and that PRP helps with the proliferation and migration. But of course, with more recent re data and research, we also know that stem cells can be actually harvested in place in location. When Alberta and I started looking into doing stem cells, we were a bit appalled that there was a real lack of science and research about how to take it safely and well. So we applied our knowledge of ultrasound and we then did an analysis of pelvises using MRI and we were able to determine the optimal way to take stem cells. And so we published this paper on our findings. We found that the PSIS is a table, not a point, and it's about a centimeter wide. 
turns out that if you enter from the medial aspect at a specific angle, instead of having only three centimeters distance to the distal cortex, this gave you almost seven centimeters to the distal cortex, making it much, much safer in a much easier way and giving you a greater harvest of stem cells. And so now we use ultrasound to find that medial aspect, to find the exact entry point. We're then able to angle it perfectly and get in and have a much safer, easier way to avoid problems, complications, and of course, more optimally obtain the stem cells. Here's an example of what we do in the office. And this is an actual patient that I'm doing this on. You can see the ultrasound there in the background. And you can see that I'm watching where I'm gonna put it. I can then optimally place it, angle it, and then drill in, get in. And then once I'm in, go ahead and obtain that bone marrow aspirate for concentration of stem cells. This is something that has really been a big difference. We've used this in patellar tendons. We found that it has really taken it up a notch and it's made a big difference for us. So ultrasound is gonna really significantly improve accuracy, improve patient satisfaction, improve workflow and reimbursement. And by adding orthobiologics to your paradigm, ultrasound will help you be able to treat more patients better non-surgically and a lot safer. Thank you very much. All right, great. Hey, thanks a lot, Alan. Um, quick question for you. Um, how did you get started kind of with ultrasound in terms of um, learning how to use it, the basics, um, knowing what you're looking at? What are your, some, what are your thoughts on that? So how to get started with orthobiologics, you mean? Uh, ultrasound. 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 Using, using ultrasound. So in using ultrasound, my best way is just simply get, it, get one into your hands and just play with it. So maybe go visit someone, you know, come down, visit with Alberto and I, hang out for a while, uh, just play with the machines. My, my best example with my fellows is I hand them one of my machines, my older machines, and I say, here, go home, go grab your significant other, bring them a bottle of wine and ask them to just get naked for you for a little while and just play. The, the reality is, is that that may sound a bit weird, but just being able to just scan, 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 get comfortable with angles, holding the unit without having that, that stress of it's a patient in front of you. And looking at MRIs, getting like a, a CD of an MRI and be able to scan through all the cuts to learn what each different angle is gonna give you, what each layer gives you. To me, that's one of the easiest way. And I'll tell you, that's how I got started. So in, in 2009, I had called Sonocyte and I said, hey guys, can I borrow a unit? And they, they, loaned, they were gracious enough to loan me one for three weeks. And you know what? They came back to pick it up. And I'm like, no, you can't have it. Just here's a check. Just take the money and go away. I'm, I'm keeping this one. And it, it was phenomenal. I mean, it, it really convinced me. And it really just does. You got to get it in your hands. You got to play with it. You can't just have like an hour or two with it. You, you need like a couple of weeks with it. Gotcha. Great. Well, um, great talk. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle next. Uh, again, Kyle's a <clears throat> private practice, uh, physical therapist, uh, owner of Results Physical Therapy, and he's going to talk about how physical therapy um, plays into our medical treatment uh, with uh, use of PRP and stem cells. All right, thank you, Dr. Leathers. Um, so great talk, Dr. Hirohara. It's always an uh, honor to hear you talk and uh, definitely always uh, learn something new every time I hear you, so thank you. And uh, thank you everybody for uh, signing up for the Sacramento Orthopedic Center and Results Physical Therapy webinar. I hope everybody is staying safe and uh, is comfortable and having some wine as, as they enjoy, hopefully you enjoy this webinar this evening. So we're bringing like seven different countries together. We thought it was just gonna be a regional uh, webinar, but it looks like it's regional, national, and international. So we're bringing the world together on just one free webinar. So thanks guys. Again, I'm located out here in Sacramento, California. We have a 13,000 square foot facility. And uh, along with the Sacramento Orthopedic Centers, we have some team affiliations and we're trusted by some of the teams up here in the Northern California area. But I have to say that it is an honor 
uh, to work with a group of uh, forward-thinking doctors to deliver innovative orthopedic medicine to the patient. We've been working together as a team for almost, um, I gotta say this quietly, but almost 20 years. I know I look only 35, but uh, it's really been almost 20 years that we've been together as a team. And it's, uh, it's, been, a collaborate, it's been a great collaboration with the doctors uh, with their uh, advances in orthopedic medicine that we're able to develop some of their protocols for surgical and ortho, orthobiologic rehab. And again, back in uh, with, these, with uh, these doctors, Dr. Hirohara in 2007 started using the PRP to enhance the healing of his surgical repairs. In 2009, he implemented the use of diagnostic ultrasound into his pra clinical practice and was at the forefront of using PRP as a therapeutic injection. Along came Dr. Pinero in 2014, when he joined the practice, and along with Dr. Hirohara, continued the advancements of orthobiologics. Even tonight, we have a team approach delivering innovative orthopedic medicine. We have uh, representatives from the diagnostic ultrasound uh, as they continue to update and uh, continue to improve the quality of the systems. We also have representatives from systems that can extract uh, platelets from plasma or mesenchymal stem cells from bone marrow aspirate. We have physicians that are able to um, perform therapeutic injections. We also have physical therapists and athletic trainers that will provide the rehabilitation following these uh, injections. With all of this together, we maximize the potential for a successful patient result. However, an inadequacy of any of the above may, comp may compromise the patient's outcome. Tonight, I'm simply just going to talk about rehabilitation following uh, the injections of a platelet-rich plasma and stem cells. This is going to be a very quick uh, uh, overview of how we, uh, how we rehabilitate after the injection. So as Dr. Hirohara has already uh, talked about, the indications are for tissue repair, diminished inflammation, diminished pain, augment HA secretion, and augment stem cell migration and proliferation. After the injection, these platelets are activated and there is a near complete release of growth factors occurring in one hour. The Mazaka, uh, Mazaka study in 2012, he actually found that tenocyte proliferation continued and actually peaked at three to four days following the injection and it can continue up to seven days. At this point, you can get another PRP injection to help augment the first injection so you can continue on with the tissue healing. For the location of the injection, it's, it's usually either intraarticular, into the muscle, tendon, or ligament for repair, or paratendon or paraligament uh, to address pain during a season. The common sites for an intraarticular injection are the shoulder, knee, hip, foot, and ankle and elbow joints. And the indication is basically to, um, to change the negative microenvironment of the joint into a positive microenvironment by decreasing inflammation, decreasing pain, promoting the synovial lubrication and stem cell recruitment. The rehab here is actually pretty simple. Ideally, we'll have the patients with lower extremity involvement, partial weight bearing for three days, and then limit their steps per day for approximately seven days. In cases such as adhesive capsulitis where range of motion is a restriction, right after the injection, we wanna begin range of motion immediately. And because we're not really um, uh, repairing any tissue, we can start strengthening the surrounding uh, muscles in short range, and they can actually return to basic ADLs and activities as tolerated. If the injection is actually into the muscle or into the tendon, now our indication is actually to repair the, the tissue. And as Dr. Hirohara's um, tendon case uh, back in July, he looked at, he saw this, the defect and he already talked about it being a six millimeter defect, gave the PRP injection by Dr. Pinero. And you can see as seven days later, uh, there was a filling in of that defect. At this point, he received a second PRP injection and continued on to a full recovery. So this rehab is actually a little bit more conservative. And for week one, upper extremities and lower extremities, we keep it quiet and have no activity. If they're lower extremity, we're gonna keep them non-weight bearing, put them in a walking boot for about seven days. 
weeks two and three, we're going to begin uh, PT with non-aggressive range of motion and definitely caution from uh, stretching the tissue and continue with weight bearing progressions. As weeks three and four come around, you can progress the range of motion. At this point, you can start uh, gently stretching the tissue. By week five, you can treat this as just an affected strain or sprain. However, if we're using a, a more robust stem cell injection rehab, we're gonna be a lot more conservative with our timelines. We're gonna add about like two, two more weeks to each phase. Usually this is because of uh, these conditions are a little bit more chronic in nature or they have a larger non-healing tissue. So this is not a very fast rehab process. And we've even found that it's taken maybe up to eight, 10, even 12 weeks before the patients even notices a difference. So you have to be patient. Also, the patient's cost out of their pocket is gonna be about three to $5,000. So we wanna make sure that we're giving the patient the best opportunity for tissue healing. Another good option is during the season, if a patient is, or if an athlete that has a nagging pain, we can actually give them a PRP injection to address the fusiform swelling by just bathing the tendons and ligaments. And also growth factors are coming to that area for possible tissue repair. And some of these common sites are the patellar tendon, hamstring tendon, uh, the common flexor and extensor tendon. And basically here is just rehab uh, for just two to three days, just have them rest. After that, uh, avoid stretching beyond their limits and they can actually begin their act full activity by day three. This can be done a couple of times during the season. So just, uh, just a quick summary. If it's uh, just a basic inflammatory bursitis or tendonitis, we're looking at less than a week of returning back to their activity. If you're looking at tissue repair, then it's gonna be uh, for the mild ones, grade ones, it's gonna be about three to four, maybe five weeks. Grade two is a little bit longer, about six to eight weeks. And then grade threes or greater, you can look at two months or even up to four months. Here's an example of some of our uh, protocols that we have on our website. Uh, they can also be um, picked up through Dr. Panero's as well as Dr. Hirohara's website. And then if you'd like more information, I know that this was pretty quick and, and, and um, just pretty simplified, but if you do want a future webinar on the sciences of orthobiologics, please let us know on your survey so, um, so that we can maybe do a course in the future. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Kyle, that was great. Um, next talk is gonna be from Alberto Panero. He is gonna talk about billing and reimbursement for this. <clears throat> and um, we've gotten some questions about slides and the information. And uh, Dr. Panero's talk is gonna be, have a lot of numbers and charts and tables that I think are gonna be great to reference later. Um, Alberto, is there a great, a good way to, to kind of, so people can just relax and watch the presentation? Is there a way they can get this information uh, so they don't have to try and take a picture of it? Because uh, you do have some great slides coming up. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And welcome again to everybody. It's great being here. Thanks, Dr. H, for putting this all together. I know you've worked really hard on this, so I appreciate being a part of it. Kyle, same to you. Um, as far as that goes, I think one easy thing is at the end, we can maybe put on the chat a copy of the publication that we did for the billing manual a couple years ago that will have a lot of the codes that we're referencing and a lot of the techniques on how to efficiently bill and code for ultrasound. Um, as far as some of the other slides, uh, we may be able to get some copies on a PDF format, uh, but we can do that on a case by case basis. And certainly all of these uh, publications are available online. So if you just go on Google and put our names in the title of the manuscript, I'm sure it will pop up. All right. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen here. Right, there we are. Okay, guys, as you know, I'm gonna be chatting uh, briefly about ultrasound billing and coding pearls. I do have a few disclosures. 
Um, I'm going to talk about some brief objectives here. We're going to start with diagnostic versus interventional CPT codes. I'm going to go over the reimbursement and how much you get paid for each code. And then I'll briefly uh, talk a little bit about in-office versus surgical coding and what you have to do to make sure you document and record your images appropriately. A couple of ground rules. Um, the reimbursement guidelines I'm going to show you in these fee schedules, they're essentially based off of the current CMS, uh, specifically Noridian, non-facility fee schedule for the Sacramento area. So the rules and fee schedules may vary state to state and between commercial plants. So just make sure you, you're aware of that because I know we have people listening in from uh, all parts of the world and of the country. And obviously we're talking about reimbursement and we want to be able to be efficient and maximize what we get reimbursed. But remember, you want to believe in the science of ultrasound and always do what's right, what's best for the patient, uh, regardless of the reimbursement. Okay, so like I was mentioning, types of codes. First, we're going to start with diagnostic codes. You have two main ones, uh, the 76881, which is for a complete evaluation, and the 76882, which is for a limited evaluation. I'm going to go into that in a little more detail. Interventionally, uh, the, any non-joint or non-bursa needle guidance with ultrasound, you're going to use the 76942. And uh, recently, or a few years now, they bundled together the joint injection code with the needle guidance. So you have a selection of three codes depending on the size of the joint. So anytime you do a joint or bursal injection, you're gonna use either the 20611, the 06 or the 04 respectively, uh, depending on the size of the joint. When you use these codes, um, you wanna make sure that uh, you use a modifier uh, 25, which you're doing here, especially if you're using an ENM code for a follow-up visit or a new patient visit, you wanna make sure you tell the insurance carrier that, hey, I did a separate procedure uh, with the ultrasound from the ENM visit, and therefore you have to use this 25 modifier. Now I will tell you to use a little bit of caution, don't overdo it and make sure that you have appropriate documentation to support that you did a separate identifiable procedure. Um, this is the, the paper I was referring to, and Dr. H mentioned this as well. This is a complete guide, so don't stress too much about trying to write down all the codes and all the reimbursement guides, because this will be a great reference to go back to. So I'm going to go into a little more detail about each code, starting with the limited ultrasound evaluation. So essentially, this is that, that extension of the physical exam. You're examining somebody. Uh, you're a little suspicious about a potential uh, structural injury, so you can literally just grab your ultrasound put it directly on the body part. In this case, essentially, you just wanna look at the biceps tendon or you wanna look at the biceps tendon and the rotator cuff. So you're not gonna go and do a whole three-dimensional scan, but you're gonna be very specific to a spot. You're gonna use the 76882 limited ultrasound evaluation code. And currently this is reimbursing about $71.71. And 71 cents. If you're gonna be a little more thorough or complete, you're gonna use the 76881, sticking with the shoulder. At this point, you're gonna evaluate not only the joint, but the tendons, the ligaments, the muscles, and all the surrounding soft tissues. And obviously you have to make sure you document on all those tissues to make sure you can hit the complete uh, evaluation. Currently, this is reimbursing about $100.79. So how does this increase, You know, how does this work in real time? Well, think about a patient that comes in for a level follow-up, you use a 99213 code, um, you get reimbursed $79.08. Now you decide that you want to use um, and add a limited ultrasound evaluation, which by the way, literally can take 30 seconds once you get really efficient with it. And now you've increased your reimbursement by 91% because you get to bill not only for your follow-up, but for your diagnostic evaluation. If you want to take a little bit more time and do a complete ultrasound evaluation, then you can increase to about 127% because now you're getting an additional $100.79 for that. So uh, what I guess to the point I'm trying to make here is that not only did you save the patient time, but likely not having to get an MRI, you got more diagnostic information in real time, but you're also were able to significantly increase your reimbursement without um, a lot more time consumption. What about interventional ultrasound codes? Well, like I mentioned, the 76942 is for any um, non-joint ultrasound uh, needle placement. This is currently uh, reimbursing $61.22. And the way that you're gonna use this code is that you're essentially gonna combine it or attach it to your already existing injection codes. So for instance, if you're doing a tendon injection and you use the 20551, you're gonna add on the 76942 and you're gonna get uh, reimbursed for both codes. 
Same thing if you do an ultrasound guided carpal tunnel injection, you're still gonna use the same carpal tunnel injection code, but you're gonna add on the 76942 ultrasound guidance code. Okay, what about uh, joint injections? Like I mentioned, uh, these uh, got bundled together where it's one code for both things. Um, and it's only specifically for joints and bursas, okay? So anytime you do a joint or bursa injection, you're gonna go with this code. Uh, the 20611 is for your large joints, the shoulder, the hip, and the knee. Currently, this is reimbursing $100.14. For your intermediate joint, which is going to be your wrist, your elbow, or your ankle, uh, you're going to use the 20606 um, code. This is currently reimbursing $84.55. And for your small joint, you're going to use the 20604, which is uh, giving you about $76.14. So how do we put this all together? Uh, similar example as the last one. Well, let's take a knee joint, right? So if you do a knee injection, palpation guided, you're going to get $65.42. Uh, like Dr. Hirahara mentioned, it does really not take that much longer, if at all, to do it ultrasound guided. You get to put it in the right spot. And guess what? Now you've increased your reimbursement by 53% uh, to uh, $100.14. Okay, so everybody wins here. Uh, and let's take a tendon injection. So lateral epicondyle, it's a common extensor tendon injection. Uh, typically, you would get reimbursed $59.41 if you did it palpation or landmark guided. But now by adding ultrasound, not only are you more accurate, but you get 103% increase in reimbursement because you essentially doubled what you're getting back by using ultrasound guidance because you get an additional $61.22. So again, it's a win-win for everybody here. Let's go over and switch a little bit of, of gears here from specific coding to just some um, you know, frequently asked questions. Can I bill for a diagnostic and procedural ultrasound code on the same date of service? And the answer here is no, uh, you cannot. So that's one thing you have to keep in mind. If you do a diagnostic evaluation, you wanna bring the patient back for the injection, or if not, you just won't be able to bill for both, but just make sure you keep that in mind. Um, what about uh, what if I do a diagnostic evaluation for two different body parts? Well, in this case, you can actually bill for that, but you have to be careful. You have to be very clear with your documentation. So essentially what you have to do here is you have to document on why you did, you know, two separate and individual uh, diagnostic evaluations. And you have to use this 59 modifier, which essentially tells them, hey, I did a distinct procedural service. But just like with the 25 modifier, you want to be careful here, not overdo it, make sure your documentation supports it, and ensure that you do two separate procedure notes for it. What if I do multiple injections? How is that going to work while they're billing? Well, depends what type of injection you do. Uh, but if you do a non-joint injection and you use the needle guidance code, the 76942, regardless of how many injections you do that day, you can only bill that code once, okay? Now, what will change is that, for instance, if you do uh, bilateral carpal tunnel injections, you're going to only get one, one unit reimbursed for the 76942, but you will get, you know, the, the 1.5 for, um, for the carpal tunnel injections as long as you use the modifier 50, letting them know that I did bilateral injections. Now, let's say it's different body parts, like a knee and a shoulder, uh, then you're going to use, you know, the 20611 code and you're gonna basically try to use that 59 modifier and say that you did different body parts, okay? Um, so you have to play around with the codes a little bit, but at the end of the day, you wanna make sure that you document appropriately and use separate procedure notes. Um, and also, if there's any doubt, just bring the patient back and do the, the subsequent evaluation or procedure on a different day. All right, what about uh, surgical considerations? So what if you're using the ultrasound unit at a surgical center, or let's say you're borrowing uh, someone else's in your practice who bills under different tax ID. Well, in that case, you have to use the modifier 26, which you're basically reporting that, hey, I am only billing for the professional component here. It's not my machine. I'm not billing for the facility fee here. And, I, and I'm basically just using someone else's machine. Now, unfortunately, the reimbursement does go down here, as you can see, for the 76942, it's only 33, and the 76881, which is diagnostic eval, another $33 there. But at the end of the day, it's not your machine. You didn't, you're not uh, paying for the for the machine itself, and therefore you have to be sure that you report that. All right. What about recording of images? This is also very important. You have to make sure 
uh, that you have a permanently uh, recorded image. You can do it as a printed uh, image. You can do it on an electronic medium, but it has to be uh, kept in the patient record and you have to make sure that it's archived because if um, you know someone asks for it, you have to be able to reproduce it. And they do not technically need to be submitted with the claim, but if you're asked, you wanna make sure that you can provide it. Documentation, like I've been trying to harp on, it's very important like with any billing uh, procedures here. You want to make sure that you have a written report of all ultrasound studies, and that should be maintained in the patient record, um, and make sure that they're available if an insurer uh, requests it for you to uh, see what kind of coding that you used with it. This is a, a simple basic one that we use. Um, if, you know, This is for the shoulder. The main things you want to make sure you notice that you have the patient demographics, data, data of service, what type of ultrasound machine you used, the body part scanned, laterality, and like any imaging report, you want to have your findings and also an impression of your evaluation. All right, we're going to do two quick case examples, and then we're going to hopefully move on to the Q&A and the after party. So real quick here, 72-year-old female uh, with a history of knee arthritis. You've seen her before. You're doing a series of visco supplementation injections. Uh, however, uh, she notes that she's now feeling more pain over the patellar tendon. Your clinical exam is suspicious for possible patellar in tendon injury. So you said, hey, let me do uh, my ultrasound evaluation here. You scan the patellar tendon and decide, hey, you know what? There's no uh, injury here. We're going to just proceed with the hyaluronic acid injections. Well, how are you going to bill for that? Well, you're going to have your traditional, your e &M code for follow-up. You're going to use your 25 modifier to then note that you did a limited ultrasound evaluation because you just looked at the patellar tendon. But it would be my recommendation not to do the injections that day. You'll probably have to bring her back and then use the 20611 because remember, you cannot bill for a diagnostic ultrasound evaluation and injection on the same day. Uh, different case, but similar type of idea here. 54-year-old female, hand numbness for three months, no injury or trauma, symptoms are worse in the first three digits wakes her up at night. She's got the positive flick sign, clinically suspicious for carpal tunnel syndrome. You get your ultrasound out. She has median nerve hypertrophy and, and signs of entrapment. So this really feels like it's carpal tunnel syndrome to you. And you decide to do a carpal tunnel injection on the same day of the visit. Well, how are you going to code for this? Well, again, you have your ENM code. Uh, you're going to use your 25 modifier. Uh, now, instead of the joint code, this is a non-joint code. So you're going to use the 76942 combined with your carpal tunnel injection. And then the real question is, well, do you bill for the diagnostic ultrasound evaluation? Yes or no. And this one's a little tricky because you certainly did use the ultrasound to make the diagnosis of a carpal tunnel syndrome, right? And that helped you lead to the fact that you're going to do an injection. But in this case, I think the safe bet is to not uh, code for both of them on the same visit. If anything, again, do the diagnostic ultrasound evaluation on the same day and then ask the patient to come back to do the injection if you want to be a little bit um, cleaner with the billing. Again, not to harp on this point, but I'm telling you guys, this is an awesome guide. We really put a lot of work into this. And like Dr. H mentioned, it, we published it four years ago, but all the codes are still the same. Some of the reimbursement might be a little bit different, but um, this is an awesome guide uh, that you can uh, reference to look at all the coding. With that, I want to give a little shout out to uh, one of my childhood idols, uh, Diego Maradona, who passed away last week. Just want to give him a little uh, shout out there. But thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, this was an awesome experience for everybody and hope to uh, chat with you in the Q&A soon. All right. Great. Hey, thanks a lot, Alberto. That was great. I hope everyone was able to, <laughs> to track down all those numbers there. <laughs> I know. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to open up some questions here. Um, uh, Alberto, since we just finished with you, I'm just going to ask, um, can you bill for ultrasound um, and a PRP on the same visit? Kind of how do you um, navigate, navigate those two, two things? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think that in general terms or the answer for that or the quick answer is no. And I think any time that you're going to uh, ask for to do an out-of-pocket payment, uh, you don't want to do it on the same day that you bill the insurance for an office visit or for a procedure. So what I will typically do there is do a diagnostic evaluation, uh, discuss kind of injection options, and if it's going to be PRP and it's going to be out-of-pocket, 
uh, then I'm going to ask them to come back and do it on a later date. And another important thing is you want them to sign, especially if they have Medicare, but you should do it with all insurances to do a, an ABN, which is an advanced beneficiary notice uh, agreement, essentially letting the patient know that, hey, this is likely not covered by insurance or it will not be covered by insurance and that they, they're in agreement of paying out of pocket for it. Uh, so the short answer is no, I, I would not bill insurance and cash pay on the same visit. Mm -hmm. And um, how are you, are, are insurance companies covering PRP injections now? Which ones have you had success with? Which ones have you not yeah, had success it, with? It, um, you know, I've been doing this for, you know, seven years now. And I think finally we've seen a few companies pay for PRP. Um, I know some worker comp insurances will pay for it. TRICARE uh, will pay for it, but it, we're talking about TRICARE primary people who are in active service. They will pay for it for knee arthritis and also common extensor tendinopathy or lateral pecondylitis. You have to get authorization, but it does get paid for. And I've had a few instances where patients have gotten reimbursed. You know, after we do the procedures, they submit the super bills and they have gotten paid, but it's not typical. It's not usual. I would still say most of the time they are not getting paid for by private carriers at this point. Gotcha. All right. Um, let's see. Um, Alan, uh, a couple questions here for you. Um, what would you say are some of the top reasons um, that doctors should use ultrasound for injections? Is it, um, is it just billing um, just to make more money? What, 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 what do you think is the most important thing? The most important thing for me is whatever the person is trying to get into it for. So obviously if, if billing is important, then that's their prerogative to go with that. Um, my big thing for me has always been just the ability to treat patients better. And it's always come down to that for me. And it just blew me away about how well I could do a better job with patients their satisfaction. You wouldn't believe the number of people that I've seen, I've done injection for, and they're like, well, I had injection, didn't work, and it just hurt. And I said, well, well, hold on, hold on. Let's talk about what the goals are. What are we doing? What have you got? Let's get the diagnosis. Let's let's apply the proper treatment here. And it's, it blows me away how all these people, like, they go, wow, that, that is so different. And um, one of the big questions we're seeing commonly, Mike, you brought this up earlier, is... Um, you know, how can they get this information? And uh, so I put this slide together really fast in the background. And we are actually live streaming this webinar right now on YouTube. And we're doing it to my youtube.com here, RMD. And we're also going to have the slides up on sh uh, SlideShare. And this recording, my lecture, and all the references that we've talked about are all found on my website. So you can download the PDFs directly so you don't have to pay for them. Um, so I just want to kind of put that up there, show you that you can all get all this information directly today. Um, but really, I think at the end of the day, this comes down to the patients. That's why we're all here. That's what we're doing. And in the end, this makes a big difference. And that's why I think it's so important. I use this in surgery now. I use ultrasound in surgery. I've published a number of papers on how to use ultrasound in surgery to do a better job for my patients, making these tiny incisions and doing repairs we never could do before. So in the end, that's what it's about. Just the patient. Yeah, I think the accuracy is what's, um, you know, I think really important is, you know, where the medication um, is going. And so I think that's the biggest thing right there is that is, you know, it's going where you want it to go. Um, question here, maybe Alberto, you kind of mentioned it about storing images. Um, uh, Scott Stringer asked a question about, uh, how many images do you take? Uh, where do you store them? Um, does it matter on which body part? Um, so I typically, you want to do a long axis and a short axis view. Um, you obviously want to try and label the, the, the images, like whether it's right, left, um, you know, what specifically you're looking at. And then if you want, you can get more specific and put arrows or circles around the tear. But I think for just purposes, you want to make sure that uh, the patient's name's on there, the date of service, and what body part you're doing. And typically, you want to do at least two, one long axis, one short axis. I store them on the machine, which actually has a USB drive, and they kind of automatically get done, downloaded into the USB. 
And then once a month, I take the USB out and I uh, do a backup copy on Dropbox. And that's how I store all my images. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the end of the day, as long as you have them and they're in a, you know, HIPAA secure place and you have them dated and you have them labeled appropriately where if someone asks, you can go ahead and grab it, it's fine. Alternatively, if you still have paper charts, you can print uh, the picture because most of these will come with a small printer and you can just attach it to your ultrasound report or to a copy in the paper chart. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually pretty simple to keep, keep track of them. And I think for efficiency, you know, just because we're, we're chatting about it, uh, and Alan mentioned this, that you want to make sure that you're efficient. So you don't want to walk in and have to turn the machine on, right, and put in the patient demographics and go. So you want a teacher, assistant, or whoever is helping you out to have that all done pre-flop. So when you walk into the room, the, the machine's on, it's ready to go, the demographics are in, and you can just grab the probe and, and start scanning and saving pictures. Um, Alan, I think um, maybe you could touch on this. We, we got a uh, question from Dr. Wahidi about types of ultrasound machines and um, which one you would recommend. That's funny. I actually just typed in the response to, directly. Um, so the, 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 the answer is pretty basic. It's whatever works best for you. What, what I found, and I've been doing ultrasound now for almost 10, 11 years now, um, it comes down to what you were taught on and what you learned on and what you can see and what you can reliably know what you're looking at. So, you know, there's some people that were, that were trained on Philips, some trained on GE, some trained on Sonosite. So it comes down to what image you like and what you can rely on when you're looking at that image. Also, you know, these, these machines go from $5,000 to, you know, $250,000. I mean, they, they can get crazy expensive. But you know what, if your job is to find the fine detail and really use it to the max, max then yeah, you, you have to spend a little bit more. <clears throat> but um, for just basic injections, you, you don't have to. The, the, the image quality has become so amazing that these inexpensive ones are very usable now. That's, so it comes down to really what, what you can afford, what you want out of it, what your goal is going to be, and what are you going to do with it? Um, great. And then, um, Alan, we got another question uh, directed uh, for you about uh, use of ultrasound and how, you know, why not just get an MRI? Um, yeah. Does it, does it, is there instances where you found, like, I guess, specific instances where you found an ultrasound is better or gives you more info than an, an MRI? Fantastic question, because really, you know, it's, it's like Alberto said this earlier, and he's so right. It's a tool. And so it's not that, you know, an ultrasound is meant to replace an MRI. That's just not the goal. Okay. And so there's places where an MRI is necessary, and you need to do an MR or an MR arthrogram or a CT. There's reasons to do those things. But there's also places where ultrasound is definitely better as well. One of the best things that I see now is being able to evaluate the actual structure of something that we can see close by, the structure of a tendon, the structure of a ligament, being able to see partial tears, subtle changes in the morphology of that architecture and being able to now address it better where MRI is not as good at that and being able to see if a PRP or stem cell is gonna be better because that's something Alberto and I have looked into. There are times when PRP is better. There's time when stem cells are better that you need to do one or the other. And it's not just arbitrary. We've gotten reasons why. So yeah, ultrasound has really helped me better understand the spectrum of pathology, especially in tendinopathies and soft tissue disease. Great. Um, Alberto, um, we got a question about billing when it uh, comes to if a, an insurance company isn't going to authorize or PRP is not covered by the insurance, can you still um, bill the insurance for use of the ultrasound and use, I guess, in an injection code? How do you um, do the billing when, when something, when a part of the procedure, I guess, is not covered? That, that's a great question. So, um, so in, in, in short, when you use the PRP code, which is 0232T, it's a temporary code, that includes everything. It's the blood harvest, the centrifugation, and the reinjection. So you cannot use a needle guidance code with the PRP code. All right, so that wouldn't mesh. That's never going to get covered. So you can't bill for a joint injection and charge the patient cash. 
the only way that it does work is if you do the two, the diagnostic evaluation, where you do a diagnostic evaluation first, for instance, a, a limiter or complete ultrasound, and then bring them back for the, um, the actual PRP injection. That's why for me, I think it's safer just whenever you're gonna do an out-of-pocket uh, visit or an out-of-pocket procedure, you bring them back separately and it's a completely separate uh, visit date. Great, all right, Kyle. Um, let's talk a little bit about therapy and um, some conditions or maybe perhaps symptoms that a patient might experience when they're rehabbing, say from a partial rotator cuff tear, or I guess whatever, I guess my question is, is where have you found PRP and stem cells to be effective for some challenging rehab diagnoses? Yeah, I think especially for those tendinopathies that come in pretty severe, such as lateral epicondylitis or patellar tendinitis, or even some that are even like long-standing plantar fasciitis in which they may have had it for a couple of years. Um, I think it's important again, to know exactly what the indications are from the doctor. So then I can have an idea of how we're going to rehab this patient. But um, those are some of the ones that I found that where we've seen a lot of success. Uh, it seems that we just keep trying and trying as, as uh, rehab professionals to just kind of keep going, but it, it's a great tool. It's a great, advantage for me to be able to refer back to the doctor and just have them take a closer look at the, at the uh, tissue and then to see if there's some type of intervention from there. And so that's where we've seen a lot of the PRP and even the stem cells. I think we just had a, a lady that had plantar fasciitis for over three years. Uh, we did physical therapy. We shut her down. We actually gave her some orthotics and shoe wear and uh, all of that. Um, it still just wasn't quite getting there. And then we actually got the, the PRP in there. And basically after like three years, she finally had a successful outcome and she's a nurse and she was able to stand on her feet for over 16 days. So um, just, just anecdotal um, treatments or uh, success stories like that. And then, you know, it, it used to be, you know, people wanted, you know, the, the, the same treatment, you know, that the Kobe Bryant treatment and stuff. I'm sure you get a lot of athletes asking about PRP, you know, recently in the news, Kemba Walker, I believed, um, you know, got a stem cell procedure. So with your high level athletes, um, you know, they're probably, they're always looking for, for something to get them back faster. How do you kind of counsel them and, and give kind of your experience with working with high level athletes and getting them back to sport? Well, it's really kind of like time dependent, whether it's the season, the end of the season, can they miss some time? If you're looking at a reconstruction of an elbow UCL, then we're looking at almost a year. Uh, if it doesn't look like it's a significant tear, they have used some uh, PRP on uh, some of the athletes and had some uh, pretty good outcomes. Uh, I would say that it's, it's better for those that are position players than I would say somebody who's a pitcher who has to throw hard on every single, on, on every single throw. So uh, it's kind of like a whole team approach and, and you know, what are the goals of, of the player? What are the goals of the team? And, and what are the goals of the, the doctors in the rehab? Uh, a lot of it is, is timing, but I would say that if you see as though there might be a little defect and if we're not going to have surgery, this is a uh, PRP or, or stem cells starting with PRP, especially is a good way to go. And, and uh, Kyle, yeah, great, great answer. I just wanted to chime in. I think it, it starts a lot too with educating the athlete, right? Because there's a lot of hype surrounding PRP and stem cell therapies. And, you know, stem cell therapies kind of encompasses a lot of different things, right? And you can get, you know, autologous tissues, uh, allografts, and they all, they're all going to do different things. And some of these t uh, allografts may not even be stem cell treatments, right? So I think it starts with getting the athlete in the room. And like you said, asking them, okay, what are your goals? What are we actually trying to accomplish with the biologic therapy? And then breaking down, okay, these are the actual biologic therapies that are available in the States that are, you know, that we can do here. And this is how we're going to use them. These are the goals. And this is how it may or may not work for you. Uh, but yeah, I agree that a lot of it has to do with timing, right? Uh, where are they at in their progression to return to sport? 
and what it is that they're trying to accomplish with the therapy. How do you, um, just kind of building a little bit on that, you know, the counseling of patients, um, can you talk a little bit about kind of what's your spiel for, for, you know, patient comes in and, you know, how do you counsel them on, does PRP work, does stem cells work? What's, how do you kind of go through it with them? Yeah, I think something Alan taught me when I was a fellow was to provide options, right? And, and discuss them openly and not just say, this is what you need, right? Or this is the only treatment you can get. Basically try to talk about, okay, you know, we can do, you know, cortisone, we can do PRP, we can do bone marrow. These are the settings that I feel that this has worked best. Um, if we inject into your tendon versus into your joint, how is that going to affect your rehab, right? And unfortunately, you know, with athlete, with non-athletes, you know, you also, there is a, a significant cost that's associated with some of these procedures. So you have to be open and transparent about that as well, as far as how that's going to be, right? And kind of what's, what's a, a better option for them. And then obviously, you know, also discuss that, hey, biologics can't fix everything, right? There, there are certainly things that it doesn't work for, and maybe surgery could be a better option, right? Um, so I think you have to just be open and discuss the plethora of options and, uh, and then let the patient go back, you know, do a little more homework on them. And then, you know, now that we're using Zoom, I think telemedicine is awesome because I'll see a patient, I'll go over the options. And instead of having to bring them back, I just go, hey, why don't we get on Zoom in a week or two when you can get through some of these options and do your own research and I'll answer more questions for you. And then they can make a final decision. Yeah, if I don't mind me just jumping in, uh, I, yeah. I agree with 100% all that. But in addition to that, I think the big discussion also is just, I think the first step is the diagnosis. And I think, I think Alberto just nailed it on the nose that the diagnosis is critical. You got to know what you're dealing with and then also what you can apply to it to make sure it's going to work or not work. Like we've done a lot more research in understanding that, for example, when we're looking at a, a hypoechoic area of tendinopathy, uh, on a tendon lesion. So it's not just fusiform swelling, it's not a rupture, it's just like that in-between phase where there might be partial tearing or just damage to the tendon itself. We found in some of our research that if it's about 0.26 centimeters squared in surface area or smaller, usually it's pretty well treated with PRP and we can get those to heal. However, if it's a larger lesion around 0.46 centimeters squared and larger, those don't do so well. We might diminish some of their pain and swelling with a PRP shot, but they don't actually get better. Like it doesn't go away. And we found that that's when we have to kind of go bigger and start using things like stem cells and be more aggressive. And so that's kind of the discussion I have is I take that knowledge and research with an understanding of exactly what's wrong, not just some general, oh, their, 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 their knee hurts, which is not adequate, and then be able to apply what we know and then be able to fix it better. That's really kind of how we do it. Yeah. Great. All right, guys. Well, that we covered a lot of stuff there. Um, I think that was that was a great discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Kyle, Allen, and Alberto, and everyone for participating and answering questions or asking questions. Excuse me. And um, so, if there's any, if there's not any more questions right now, um, we can um, or people want to jump into the after party um, and ask more informal questions, um, kind of go back and forth about a certain topic or something. We're, we're happy to do that for you. I did, um, and this is the information on zoom, uh, uh, to sign up. This is the zoom ID, uh, to, to do that right there and no, no passcode. I did want to mention, we are going to have another webinar, very similar. We're going to talk about irreparable, uh, rotator cuff tears, and that's going to be on January 14th. 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so, um, yeah, hopefully everyone enjoyed this tonight. Again, uh, the after uh, the survey that you're going to get, we really want some feedback on how we can make this better. And uh, hopefully everyone can join us on the 14th of January. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Had a great time. Hope to see you in the after party. Again, that Zoom uh, number is 916-732-3000. And uh, we'll see you there. Thanks very much.